extension of a painting, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's, yeah, it's an extension of your practice as a painter. So really the VR is just your paint, paintbrush. It, yeah, it's a medium. It's a tool, yeah. Yeah, just like oil acrylic might be. Um, yeah. yeah, different software is just yeah. another medium, yeah. Okay, right then, let's go. I'll share it. Oh, right. <laughs> Hello, my name is Dr. Alison Bajir, and today uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my virtual painting studio. Um, I'm going to describe to you my painting process and how that evolved and how I came to be working with virtual reality technologies. Um, I'm going to discuss a couple of the projects that I've used VR on um, and then how I lost my studio during the pandemic. And then how my uh, working with VR has developed and what that might mean for my own future projects and that of fellow practitioners. So here is a photograph of me sat in my studio. Um, not, I suppose, probably about six months to a year after I'd first um, got it. Um, and I love this space, I really did. Um, so here, this painting, Pine, I finished in 2012, um, and it was the start of a, <laughs> a long road of development, as hopefully you'll come to see. So I thought I'd start by describing my um, painting process. So in this slide here we have images of paper paint palettes. I started to use these when I was doing my practice-led PhD. I was trying to document painting process. I was intrigued with the unintentional mark made on the paint palette. That's compared to the intentional or strategic mark, mark made on canvas. So I ended up printing these images onto silk. Um, I wanted to hang them in the windows of galleries and hoping that the colour would seep into the gallery space. And these silk silks were sat around in my studio. I ended up stretching them over canvases um, and then applying further la layers of paint. And this incorporated the, the painting process within the actual painting, um, uh, which is obviously a long, slow process. So in this slide here, we can see a painting called Acrocafina, and it shows how um, this slow painting process developed. On the right hand side, we can see a detail of that painting. And the large green shapes are made by a brush, which is about 15 centimeters wide, and worked into it are the dashes and dots uh, made with a size zero brush. So you have this um, difference in scale, and it's kind of a difference between um, kind of an unintentional and the strategic because painting in this way with the dashes again is a very slow intentional process and it's this process that then fed into my virtual reality pro painting process as I'll go on to describe. So at the end of 2017 I became a, um, aware of a bit of software called Google Tilt Brush um, and it was launched with 
um, using a group of creators such as uh, comic book illustrators, sculptors, painters and designers who were invited to experiment with the, with this software. It sparked my interest. Um, I'd worked previously as a graphic designer using packages like Photoshop, so working with digital tools was very familiar to me. So I approached two local VR gaming centres, one in Northampton and one in Milton Keynes. Uh, the one in Northampton didn't get back to me, but the one in Milton Keynes did a place called Vertigo VR, um, and I explained um, I was an artist, lecturer and researcher at that point, not long finished my PhD, and I was excited about the potential of Tilt Brush, and they emailed me back 10 minutes later saying that they wanted to support me and, sus and sponsor me, um, so I then started to visit their centre to see teach myself how to use Tilt Brush using the HTC Vive um, hardware, as you can see in this photograph. And then on the right hand side of this shot are some of the early VR painting sketches. And, and I just started to incorporate images of my physical paint palettes. So I was now starting to combine the physical painting process with the virtual painting process. It's kind of this, this uh, digital, physical and digital combined. So to um, allow me to um, continue this experimental process, I applied to the Arts Council England and I was awarded two lots of funding, one lot to produce um, a body of work and a second amount to um, put on an exhibition. And this exhibition was called Paint Park and it was held at Milton Keynes Gallery Project Space. Um, I approached them. Uh, their, the, the main gallery is just around the corner from where Vertigo VR are based. I invited them along to Vertigo to um, view my early VR paintings through the headset um, and they became very interested in the project. So they um, allowed me to use their space um, from February the 8th um, to the 1st of March 2020 and to help with this project I managed to secure further funding and supporting kind from Hewlett Packard, HGC Vive, Google Tilt Brush, SDCN, the University of Northampton um, alongside Vertigo VR um, and this um, exhibition the whole premise was to um, kind of think about what we understand as painting and um, to test it somewhat to push those boundaries um, and also to pursue this idea of painting as place as I'll go on to discuss. So on this slide we have two videos on the left hand side these are showing the physical paint underpainting process. Here I'm using luminous paint poured and squirted and I was using luminous paint because it helps start me start to think about exploring the relationship with light and colour that is key to virtual the virtual painting encounter. And on the right hand side are two photos of a large painting evolving which is made up of ten, ten canvases and this uses the same process of underpainting taking a photograph of a paint palette but this time I combined that image of the paint palette with imagery from my VR painting um, that was printed onto silk, stretched over the canvas and further layers of paint applied. Um, so with this kind of immersive painting I wanted to allude to the virtual encounter with VR painting without having to don a headset. But art historically this li links to works like Monet's Round Room or even back further to cave painting. Hence this painting was called the Grotto painting, but also something which you might encounter in a paint, um, in a park like, um, you know, paint park as a public space to inhabit, occupy, walk or explore. So in this image you can see um, the ten canvases joined together. So ten canvases being a decaptic. Um, with the one in the middle you can see the silk isn't fixed and actually if you look closely there's a fan 
um, on the fourth canvas in and this fan um, kept that silk moving so that you could see the stretcher behind and some underpainting. So in this short video you can see a pan across those canvases and you can see the curtain moving. This area was called the grotto and it went through three separate phases which I'll explain further. So in this photograph here you can see, again see the decaptic, the grotto paintings but in UV light. So that was the second phase that the grotto paintings went through. So again it was another type of immersion being immersed in a physical space without donning a headset. But again, thinking about light and colour in a very different way. So here we have a very short video of uh, panning across those 10 um, canvases. Apologies for the poor quality, but uh, I just didn't get round to taking better video. Kick myself now. So on this slide, uh, the photo on the left, you can see the grotto room and paintings. The curtains are pulled aside for this photo, but normally they were down and it was a light controlled area going through three phases. First with the normal gallery lighting, second with UV lighting and third when I projected, projected a film onto the surface of the paintings, as seen in this short clip on the right. If you want to see the full film, it's available on my website. This film was a combination of my early VR painting sketches, a kind of virtual painting sketchbook or painting sketches from a virtual studio to give it its proper title. So here are some photographs of the installation in the project space. As you can see, the walls have the luminous paint splats continued. Um, it's basically to uh, give some sort of visual interest to what could be a very bland um, white wall space and um, but also to knit the whole um, making process together on the screens um, on the image on the photograph on the left hand side uh, you can see one area that is a tilt booth drawing area another screen which shows the making of process um, for one of the virtual reality works that I will describe shortly and then on the photograph on the right hand side you can see um, a screen that has an image of one of the virtual reality paintings um, called Topsy. I'll talk more about that shortly. So in these slides um, you can see more of the installation uh, as lit through the UV light um, and these two participants also happen to be uh, the invigilators, which were called the Paint Park Crew. Um, on the left hand side, we have Cleon Johns, who was a games design student from the University of Northampton, who also worked on the Topsy Turvy um, VR encounter. And then on the right hand side, we have Jan Harrington, who was a fine arts student also from the University of Northampton. As part of um, the a process of experimentation. Um, I started to play with augmented reality. So here you can see a small abstract sketch that was anchored to the physical canvas and it could be viewed through a smartphone or a tablet. And again this was a great way for people that didn't want to don a headset to see uh, another um, form of uh, using VR media um, but in a very interactive way. So the videos that follow are of one of my virtual reality abstract paintings. Um, this one is called Topsy Turvy and it's a painting of two halves. The first half is what you're seeing first in the next four videos. Um, it's a green base painting and it follows uh, one of my physical paint palettes so I use that as the starting point and in this particular painting I've used all the tools that 
are more closer to what we understand as physical paint so they look shiny or wet or they have texture in the way that we understand physical paint to. So Topsy actually had in the end 43,000 paint marks and that's a bit mad isn't it and um, the painting was the size of um, a two-story house this was not my intention I just um, as I said used my uh, photograph of my paint palette as a starting point that I then traced and mapped and extrapolated from so the idea being that with Topsy it was more familiar to us as a, uh, as a painting although it obviously behaves in a way that a painting doesn't it's it's in a three-dimensional space um, I can paint all around me um, shadow is cast um, we have a sense of uh, of the dimensions that it it um, lives in so what you're looking at are uh, is a film recorded in VR actually in tilt brush and it's filmed using the controller the same controller that works as a brush it can also work as a camera um, and because of that uh, functionality you can then start to make film you can also make um, GIFs um, and uh, use the content in lots of other ways. You could take stills um, as well as taking the content further and designing it as a, an encounter for the headset, which is the way that you can access Topsy by donning the headset and using the controller as a way to um, steer yourself around this environment. And that allows you to go in and out and through and under all these different paint marks so you have um, a sense of intimacy with the painting in a way that you wouldn't normally of a physical painting because you can get right in amongst the strokes amongst the marks the the next video is after the second half of that painting called turvy so the artwork's called Topsy Turvy. In Turvy, I um, went about using all of the tools in Tilt Brush that looked sort of almost the opposite to what we understand painting to look like. Look like. So you've got neon flashes and squiggles and animated bubbles and um, all these different kind of graphic qualities, but it is still created in very much the same way as Topsy was painted using a controller and dragging it in 3D space. Um, so again, it, it creates a whole nother way of thinking about painting. Here are some more clips. So um, Turvy had 10,000 marks in it's obviously a lot less than Topsy um, and it was more flat so not as tall but I think it was larger in scale um, uh, spread out I should say um, and again you could you entered it by putting your head into the headset and con using a controller to direct um, where you would go within the painting and this would again allow you through all the different layers. With that in mind, um, future projects I am pursuing making a score, recording a score. Some of that might be musical, some of it might be sounds taken from a studio. Um, obviously, not my physical studio anymore. Um, but another thing that happened was people would return to their favourite place within. Topsy and Turvy. So it's like they were virtual tourists within a painting. Um, they'd found this kind of idea at this kind of place, painting as place as I like to describe it, um, and um, kind of travelled these, uh, this kind of new land 
and sat themselves in their favourite position. Um, and I know several of the invigilators did the same thing. Uh, and I, I find this 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 a really interesting concept that you could be exploring a painting as a world, as another world or another uh, landscape as such. Anyway, Topsy Turvy was extremely well received. Um, and from this VR painting, I have produced stills and movies and it still is um, it's still teaching me a lot about abstract VR painting and the possibilities um, yeah alongside topsy-turvy was this generative uh, communal artwork so anybody who entered the turvy encounter um, had their eye tracking monitored and the brush marks that they lingered on the longest were captured and then put into this, this group work. And the artwork grew as more and more people um, participated and entered that painting encounter. This work was created with the help of Dr. Mumu from the University of Northampton and his PhD student Matada Dohan. And hopefully this is the start of future um, collaborations and generative artworks, pandemic allowing. So the, the images of this very jumbled space are my studio after the paint park exhibition. As you can imagine, there was a lot of furniture, a lot of materials all involved. So this was my studio at the beginning of March. Obviously just as the pandemic was hitting um, and before the first lockdown. But unfortunately beginning of, of March I contracted COVID-19 um, and so I wasn't using my studio space for a good few months but I was looking forward to returning to it. Unfortunately um, the news came to us in September that uh, Bedford Creative Arts, who were running the studio building, I create building in Bedford, um, were quitting the building and as such all of the artists also had to leave. Um, now this was a real blow to me. I had had this studio space for 10 years um, and uh, it was the space where it was my professional workplace. It was the place where I met fellow artists. Um, it's the place where I welcomed potential buyers, collectors, gallerists, curators in to hold discussions about the work and the possibilities for future projects. Um, as well as um, seeing the day-to-day -day people involved with Bedford Creative Arts. So the lack of this space um, had had and still has a massive effect on my life um, and I still really miss it. Because of not having a physical studio space I made the concerted effort to grow uh, my um, relations over social media um, and this allowed me to get the work out there but also to uh, make contact with fellow practitioners um, uh, to gain commissions and to um, get in contact with the audience and for me uh, my social media is a place where I post experimental work so it is an extension of my virtual reality studio um, and it allows me to test things um, and to get feedback um, which is all important when you don't have a physical studio space. So in this um, short video clip um, you can see part of my virtual reality painting process. Um, this is me painting uh, Turvy and I'm actually working from a paint palette that's of voluminous paint. You can see the brightness here. 
Um, so having a virtual reality studio um, or, and a virtual reality painting practice has been a real lifesaver for me during the pandemic and the lockdowns. Um, and obviously being without a physical studio space, it's um, been a boon. Um, and what I find really exciting is that I can use virtual reality content in so many different ways. I can export it as films. I um, recently was in the uh, video art festival in Split. Um, I can use it to export stills. I can create augmented reality work as alongside, as well as alongside uh, VR encounters. And obviously when you produce digital content, yeah, you can send it to the other side of the planet at the click of a, an email uh, as opposed to having to create work and and ship it um, or even fly it to um, a different destination. So this is obviously a great saving grace when it comes to thinking about the environmental impact, um, which I'm very aware of. And as it is, I work with renewables wherever possible. So thinking about um, future projects, on this slide, on the left-hand side, you can see um, a film of a VR painting. And this is actually what I describe as a slow painting. Um, actually, this footage is slightly sped up for this um, presentation, but the actual artwork goes uh, much, much slower. It hardly moves. So you would almost think it, it was a still, but it, it moves at a snail's pace. So these works are going to be exhibit, exhibited at the APT Gallery in the Absent Authors Group show, and the fly you can see just on the right hand side. But I also have work um, exhibited in the Lead Summer Group show, um, and the link is also the, up there. Um, I am I was lucky enough to be invited to be, um, to be part of the Digital Painting Photography Symposium um, with Darby University. So I have other projects coming up and potential um, new types of media to explore. So if you are interested in finding out more details, um, you can follow me on social media on Instagram or Twitter. And um, there's also my website as well. But thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to hearing some of your questions. Hey, thanks, Alison. I really, you know, I, I, I really liked as well the blackbird. It was so enthusiastic. <laughs> yeah, well, I know. I was really thinking about, you know, sort of chainsaws and things like that. Being, and then I have this beautiful blackbird singing in the background. Yeah, so yeah it's techie, really good for your beans. Yeah, uh, you've got some. You've got. Let's have a look. See if we've got any questions for you then. Yeah, I'm, I've just realised I was because I was working on a project and uh, in Photoshop, and I've missed one of the questions. So apologies. Okay. Um, yeah. Do I? Do you make a correlation between your virtual artwork and the physical world? Do you think of topsy turvy, for example, as being a particular size? Couple of questions there. Obviously, I've I've taken over your job, Ian. Sorry. No, that's um, fine. I can. I'll, that's okay. I'll get my mug out of it, and you can. No, carry no, on. no, that's no, fine. no. Don't. It's no. It's it, no. It's fine. Um. Yeah. So. Um. It's yes. I do make a, a correlation between the two. Um. So, importing uh, photographs of my physical paint palettes, uh, into VR. Um, as a starting point for the paintings means that there is definitely this two-way process and then once the VR painting is made I then export out again and sometimes make physical paintings from it or it might be a still or a printout that I further paint on so um, it's a two-way process it's it's you know it doesn't end just once it's in VR 
Um, and then the question, do I think of topsy-turvy as being a particular size? Again, it depends on context. So for instance, as a, a VR encounter in sort of encounter through the headset, um, I make the painting very large or the viewer very small, depending which way you see it, the Alice in Wonderland in a way. Um, so that the uh, participant, the viewer is completely immersed and completely surrounded by the artwork. So rather than just looking at sort of an image or a JPEG or a still or whatever it is, you are in, in amongst the strokes and you, you kind of physically, uh, well, you digitally navigate, but saying that we, um, sort of uh, watching people participating actually in VR, you'd find them doing these all sort of weird limbo moves as they were wishing in, in and out between the, the brush strokes, which I really love that, you know, in their mind, it's a physical mark. And quite often you'd hear the, Whoa! as they went through something um, until they realize that, yeah, it's just a visual thing, not a physical thing. Um, so it is a VR painting, the big, the big scale as a film, for example, as a slow painting film, I make very big. So the films go really, really slow. Um, and it's, it's all to do with this kind of um, uh, re different relationship, the different media sort of encourages from the uh, viewer, the participant. So a slow film encourages you to, to look a bit longer, to linger a bit longer. Um, whereas the VR encounter is a lot more physical, um, ironically. Um, then you have stills, which obviously are present all at once. Once, so you, um, and they tend to be, you know, anything from A5 to A3 size at the moment. So um, yeah, it's versatility. That's the one thing I would say about um, work, working with these digital tools that you can do so many exciting things with them. So yeah, I hopefully that answers that Lu question. Lucy's here, so she's got a question for you. you can, do you want to ask it or shall I speed it out? I can say it out loud. Um, Hi, I Lucy. just thought I'd pop it in the chat. Hi, Alison. Hi. Um, yeah, sort of a, a general question really, but I just wanted to ask it. Where do you see yourself and your you know, virtual reality art in a year's time? Oh, right, in a year's time. <laughs> well, I suppose a lot of it depends on the pandemic. Um, I've had three or four exhibitions pause this year, a couple last year. Um, so it'd be lovely if, you know, the unpause, <laughs> the play button was hit as we all want it to be, but obviously only when it's safe. Um, it kind of, uh, VR in galleries, it's a, it's a lot harder now. I mean, it was hard pre-pandemic um, when I ran paint park I had um, a staff an invigilation staff of 11 people I've never had a crew before but we had we had 11 people to make that exhibition happen happen and that was you know helping people don headsets or to learn how to use tilt brush or all, all different things within the exhibition space now taking into account the pandemic the virus um, if you're using a headset we were already disinfecting um you know you have like your face plate you put on first before the headsets put on and we disinfected the headsets after every every use and the controllers pre-pandemic so i'm really glad i was doing that but um now you'd have to have i think you need extra he headsets so that once they're used they're put aside so they're really probably much more um uh, sort of disinfected and put aside and left dry depending on what is safe for the equipment um, so you you know that's more time consuming for the invigilators it's um, you need more tech so there's a much larger investment needed if galleries want to if galleries want to run VR encounters what we're seeing is um, bigger institutes having separate rooms set aside for VR encounters. They might have a body of VR en encounters they have on their books and people book sessions. Um, that way you have a safe space that's controlled um, uh, and it's of minimal impact. It's secure 
you know, um, and as, as COVID friendly as can be. So in a year's time, I would love to think that, you know, we don't have to think so much about those things. But unfortunately, I don't think that's going to be the case. Um, I think we're just going to have to be more mindful, um, probably for the rest of our lives. But, you know, we have hopes. I'm also exploring. Um, so obviously you see these little short clips and I talk about um, working on scores. So I've got my my toy, my Rolly Seaboard. I don't know if anybody knows about these. Oh, look it up. It's a brilliant keyboard. Um, it, it has five degrees of, I can't remember how they describe it. So you can play with vibrato and slide, glissando, all those sort of, so I'm working, it's very digital. So I want to, I'm working on scores and filmmaking as well as um, printmaking. Um, dare I say the NFT words? <laughs> Um, I don't know if any conversations were had earlier in the, the day, but I'm only interested in green or clean NFTs. So, you know, I'm working for, uh, waiting for a, a healthier, safer Ethereum um, or thinking about uh, Tezos or if that's how you say it. So yeah, um, I'm open to the, that kind of arena. It's exciting time for, uh, for digital content because Obviously, so much of the world, world's population has been forced online to, to connect or even to be to view, to, ent be, to be entertained. So um, it has potential for VR, especially um, with things like the Quest 2 being, you know, quite relatively cheap. Um, and obviously other headsets, new headsets from Vive coming out. So um, it's exciting times, but um, it's very nerve wracking well as uh, an artist uh, if you aren't putting on exhibitions um you're not getting paid as much so uh, like everybody else tough times i think does that help does that clarify i think that was a good thorough answer yeah. there's a there's a question from chloe how have you found people received your vr paintings compared to the physical ones um yeah, um, it's obviously it's quite a different encounter. Um, so uh, with the VR encounter that we ran ran at Paint Park, uh, sorry, at Milton Keynes Gallery Project Space, we had the participants sat down on swivel chairs, um, mainly because of really tiny space, and we didn't put people running into the the windows or the walls. So I they couldn't physically walk around the virtual space. That makes sense. Um, I would really love to enable people to physically walk around the, the paintings. Um, but even whilst they were sat down and um, limited in that respect, the overall um, feedback was more than I could have hoped for. Um, like I said, a lot of people kept returning back. Um, you know, there was one guy who came back five or six times. <laughs> it's like hi again, um, and we kind of like, like I say, be of this virtual tourist and find their favourite views within the work, which kind of is really exciting. As an artist, even I was finding new perspectives within the within the paintings. You know, you'd paint it one way and be looking at work from a certain perspective, but you know that you could flip it, you could look below it, you look, uh, you know down on it so you could always find something new even as the person that made the work which is kind of mind-blowing in a, in a way so um it's been really really positive very there was a one or two people that um couldn't cope with the because I, I don't have um a white space within my sorry, right there, a white space um like a like a, a, a gallery white cube I, you know, I don't make walls and floors. So these artworks are floating what, in what looks like infinity. And obviously for some people, because there's the, the, the palette is almost like the, the ground, this kidney shaped palette is the ground of the, the artwork. And when people realize that they can look over the edge, then some people don't like that, but then other people kind of really embrace that. So there were one or two people, but it was really very few people. And our oldest participant was uh, an 86 year old. 
So um, I'm and I'm really glad about that. We had um, people of all abilities. So I'm the only th only limit we did have. I wouldn't allow that um, them to be entered anybody under the age of twelve, and because there's a lot of kind of discussion about um, VR and headsets and brain brain plasticity, mainly eye development issues. So um, I didn't feel that it was my decision to okay that. And until the sort of, there's kind of like uh, a standard, accepted standard, that's where I set the bar. Um, yeah, I think Vive have the age group 12, or they did at one point. I don't know if that's changed since. Do you know, Ian, if there's no, any guidance? No, I don't know. I don't no, know. I, I know there no is research that. being done, um, but you know, things have been changed a bit recently and um, I'm mm -hmm. not, um, yeah. So that was the only rule I had. Um, and we allowed um, what often we, um, we did, for instance, with tilt brush, adults would wear the headset or mum and, mum and dad might wear the headset and young children would use the um, controllers and they quite liked it because they could whoosh brushes into their parents' faces. <laughs> mm -hmm. So they'd be scaring their parents, but they could see on screen what they were drawing. So, um, yeah, can't remember the original question now. <laughs> That's yeah, about so, the reception. Yeah, the reception it, it, it was again, it was a very different type of reception. Um, mm -hmm. With the grotto paintings, because obviously physical work, but they went through three separate, separate eight, um, lighting phases when um the uv light came on so many people just sat down and chilled out um and then when the film came on you know people were playing their own soundtracks um getting the groove on and just sitting there and um being immersed so even that there was no headset they probably had some similar elements um which i like because Headsets can be a bit obtrusive, can't they? Yeah, a bit of a barrier. I've got a question, um, sure, if, if that's all right. Um, yes. Paintings, right? They age, don't they? You know, over time, they're going to age, they're going to fade. Um, but that's possibly much longer term than kind of digital, right? So how are you future proofing any of this? Right, yeah, obviously the, the tech is the thing that will age here. Um, mm. So, you know, um, <laughs> you think of video and Betamax mm -hmm. and, and you know defunct technologies. Um, no matter what we do, things will, you know, we all hope will touch wood anyway. Hopefully, we'll we'll always advance and leave behind those technologies. Hopefully, for something that works more effectively on less less energy, all those kind of things. But obviously, the coding will develop as well. Um, as an artist. It's my job to keep updated to some extent, but um, it's uh, it's a rocky ground because, uh, for instance, um, digital artists that are represented by galleries, the galleries might support that future proofing to some extent. But then there's also a relationship to be had with a collector or an institute that might house the work. Um, I suppose some of that is we're still learning. Um, and, you know, I'd really um, like to be able to keep working with this, this software. But as we know, Google have uh, are not supporting Tilt Brush anymore. But it's now, like I said, gone open. Um, they released the code. Um, so we have Open Brush out there now. So it's this whole commu community of developers that have put it out there and are developing new tools all the time. So. Um, if we think of Photoshop in the early days, uh, you know, it's we really are sort of a very early stage of, of VR and VR painting. Um, but we can still see a lot of, you, you know, those early works. You, th you think of GIFs, GIFs, depending mm. how you say it. Um, we can still view them. Um, we're just much more aware of their lower resolution. Uh, and, you know, that's going to happen. You're going to look at my work probably maybe only six months and see more of the rough edges or the bitmaps or, you know, whatever it is, the more polygon count, whatever. Um, you might be more aware of those things. Um, but 
you know that's kind of part of life isn't it like you were saying yeah yeah all, well yeah it's like a, a, and, yeah yeah and, and that's what i suppose that's, I, that's kind of what i was getting at in, in a sense of, you know with like um ephemeral art and stuff it just comes and goes doesn't it and it's yeah. whether or not you were happy for some of this to just come and go to be of its time and to just go when yeah. it goes yeah i mean um in a way this kind of it's kind of links to the the experiential economy it's another phrase again i didn't come up with um so it's more about sort of going along and encountering in much the way mm. you might go sightseeing and seeing buildings um, and, uh, you know, those buildings may long, no longer be there or you go to the cinema and you watch a movie. That movie's not always going to be playing at that cinema. It's about the encounter, the, ex the experience you gain from that, that moment in time. So um, the uh, events held at galleries and institutes are kind of more about that experiential um, encounter. Um, selling an artwork, that's really where the future future proof proof thing becomes a problem but obviously we've seen sort of the whole nft thing um people um minting early early um internet art early um, digital art um mm -hmm. because it then becomes a part of history and potentially art history although i know a lot of people cringe when you say that but you know we'll be mm -hmm. looking back probably 10 years time and um you know there are already museums of of these types of work starting to grow um so you know maybe those institutes will find different ways of dealing with it as you do with people that make uh, film or video art you know um sort of having tape films it's kind of people still do it so yeah 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 thank you Thank you for a fantastic session, for oh, really oh, thorough answers, and for you. and for your time. It's been thank fantastic, you. and that's pretty much it now. I I've just seen one more question. Have we? Oh, what's here we the go, yes. file of these things? <laughs> I imagine them being huge and with many marks. Yeah, I did actually say, James, um, that one of the Topsy is forty-three thousand marks, and Turvey is ten thousand marks. Topsy is two stories high, and big <laughs> there you are <laughs> go on how many gigabytes can you remember if it's, if it's <laughs> no I, no um because well obviously poly has been shut down um so uh i cannot remember the size um yeah sorry <laughs> uh okay. i i don't even think about i don't load allow those things to limit me if i can uh, avoid that um obviously only if computers die do i have to really address that um, and usually then I'll try and find extra ways of, um, you know, making it work. And I did see that um, Zoom did struggle a bit with the frame frame rate on, on the on the video. And um, when I made that um, that presentation, I made it on Keynote and Keynote won't cope with 4K, which was really frustrating. So you're already seeing a lower resolution mm -hmm. than I would normally share. So um, but yeah, there you are. That's the whole future proofing thing, isn't it? It's as we get more advanced. Hey, we'll all we'll have glasses anyway, AR glasses, and it, it'll all be in front of us and technology be able to ha yeah, handle I'm, big files. I'm Hopefully. going to get AR eyes refitted. <laughs> are you now? <laughs> I just, I'll Thank just go with much. contacts. It's a lot easier <laughs> and probably cheaper. Yeah. Thanks, AI Alison, contact. so much for an absolutely wonderful session, and it's lovely to see you again. Um, thank Best you, person. everybody who attended, and yes, we hope you. that you've had an absolutely splendid time. And thanks for sticking with us all afternoon, some of you. And yeah, yeah, that's congrats. it. Absolutely thank wonderful. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. You take care now. Bye bye. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. Bye bye.